I invite you to remain standing for the reading of God's word, which comes to us from the 16th chapter of the Gospel according to Mark. We are in the final chapter here, and we're going to be reading from the first eight verses. So listen now to the word of God. And when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, although it was extremely large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right, wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. And he said to them, do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who has been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he said to you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had gripped them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You all may be seated. Heavenly Father, as we look to our text this morning, our Easter text in this Advent season, Lord, I pray that you open up our hearts and our minds, that your Holy Spirit enlighten us, so that we can remember what indeed It is that we celebrate Christmas. Why, indeed, it is so that we can be pointed toward Easter. So, God, I pray for your guidance and your wisdom, still voices of concern and fear and pain that are in our hearts and in our minds. Lord, we pray all this in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen. So, like I said, we are here at the end of Mark. We're at Mark chapter 16. And uh, we are looking at the resurrection. Like I said, it's a peculiar time to be looking at the resurrection here in the season of Advent. But it is important to remember why Christ came. Christmas is a fantastic day. It's a great day to celebrate the birth of our Savior. But we can't just forget that there was a reason why he had to be born. Uh, There was a reason why he had to come into this earth. There was a reason why God incarnated himself in man. And we find out that reason here in the 16th chapter of Mark. Let me go through and and talk a little bit about what's going on here. Remember last week we saw uh, what had happened with uh, the the folks who were least expected or who at least, you know, the the disciples would have least expected to remain around Jesus. Uh, If you remember, we looked at the three women that were mentioned here, Mary, Mary, and Salome, and there were many others, Mark tells us, how they remained at the foot of Jesus uh, on Calvary as they wept and watched as Jesus uh, died. We also were introduced to Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, We talked about who he was, a a member of the council, one of the Sanhedrin, uh, one of the the leaders, and a prominent one at that. These these two folks, or I guess you have the uh, Joseph of Arimathea and, and the women, they, they represented folks who, again, one of Mark's themes, folks that we would not expect to be insiders, folks who you think would, would flee. You know, we often think of in, in Hollywood and other places, the damsel in distress or, 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 or the weak woman who, who, who faints at the side of, of anything uh, bloody or gory. These women had more fortitude than the rest of the disciples. Again, something that would be surprising. And of course, Joseph of Arimathea, one of the leaders, an insider, if you will, who was counted amongst the outsiders, is actually really, truly an insider. And so these same women are gathered uh, on the first day of the week. These are good Jews. We have to remember who, who, we're, who we're looking at here. Uh, these are very good Jews, and they knew that uh, they couldn't do anything on the Sabbath. That was the, that was the, the day that the Lord had called for rest. Uh, And so, thankfully, Joseph of Arimathea was able to get Jesus' body into a tomb uh, before the Sabbath really took off on that time of preparation. Uh, And if you remember, back in chapter 15, uh, in verse 47, Mary and Mary and and, uh, Salome, or at least those two are listed there, uh, that they're looking on uh, to see where Jesus was laid. 
That's important. I remember, if you remember, I asked you to recall that last week uh, because that's an important key to what's going on in our passage today. The, they witnessed the, the stone being rolled over uh, the entrance to Jesus' tomb, and they knew how large that stone really was. And so going and doing the Sabbath, taking time of rest, now comes the first day of the week, Sunday, our Sunday, what we know as Sunday. Uh, the first day of the week comes, the Sabbath was over, and now Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome, they, they went and bought spices. Another hint as to uh, that these are good Jews. Uh, the Jews didn't embalm, and in fact, many uh, Jews today, uh, they, they don't embalm their, uh, their dead. They, they want them to, to decay naturally. Uh, they don't put in those chemicals. And so uh, they were not embalmed, or Jesus' body was not embalmed, and so they came to bring spices so that they could wrap him because they didn't have that opportunity uh, when he had died. That because, again, it was, Sabbath was very soon. They wanted to get his body in the tomb so that uh, they could go and do their Sabbath rest. And so now they wanted to come and, and, and wrap him up in, uh, in these burial spices. And so very early, uh, Mark says, verse 2, very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. Just as an aside, this is one of the reasons why we as Christians, why we are gathered here today and not on Saturday. Uh, because it was when Jesus had risen on the first day of the week, which later became known as the Lord's Day, as uh, John describes in the book of Revelation. Uh, here, this is the day that the Lord was resurrected, the day that he burst forth from that tomb, uh, the day when the new covenant sealed in Christ's blood uh, the doors were flung open for that new covenant so that even the Gentiles, you and I, may come and partake in it. And so the first day of the week becomes an important symbol for Christians, which is again why you and I are gathered here this morning and not yesterday morning. Verse 3, we see that they, they, they come, and you remember, again, verse 47 of chapter 15, here verse 3, they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us to the entrance to the tomb? They, they knew that someone had rolled that stone at first, that the tomb was sealed. They watched it. They saw it happen. And now they're going out early in the morning, and it's before sunrise, so they're, they're trying to figure out, well, who's going to be there? Uh, who do we have? We didn't bring anyone along with us to, to help us open up this tomb. They, they were worried. There was no uh, work that had been done, so we clearly would, should not have been open on Saturday uh, because the, the Jews would not have done that. And, and that they were alone. They didn't have any men with them. They didn't have any folks who were strong enough to open it. And so they're, con they're worried. They're concerned. Uh, they, they come to Christ thinking <laughs> that he is still dead, that he is something that he is not. Too often we sometimes think that way, don't we? We come to Jesus looking, expecting something that he is not. We say in our hearts, who's going to roll away the stone? Who, who, is there a way for us to, to open up in order to understand Jesus? Well, guess what? Jesus came out of the tomb. They didn't need to open up the tomb because as we see in verse 4, they look up and they saw that the stone had been rolled away. And Mark adds, although it was extremely large, it had already been rolled away. It was already open. As soon as they, they, that tomb comes into their, into their line of sight, they're worried that the, the stone is still on it. But they look and they see that the stone has been rolled away. That the way to Christ has been opened to them. Notice it's the work of God. Church, we, we can't forget that God's sovereign power reigns over all things, especially our access to Christ. God is the one who rolls away the stone. God is the one who turns our hearts of stone into hearts of of flesh. It is God who raises people from the dead. The dead can't raise themselves. 
Church, we have to remember that God is sovereign in all of this. And we see as the women come to the tomb, they see that the, that, that has been rolled away, and so they enter into the tomb. Put yourself in their shoes for a second. Think about what they're expecting to see. They're expecting, again, that tomb closed. They're expecting to see Jesus still lying in there. They're concerned. They're confused. And instead, what they find is this open tomb, and then they find this strange man sitting inside. Can you imagine how terrified they may have been? How confused they may have been? How concerned they were? Thankfully, they... This angel, this person speaks to them. This young man sitting at the right. We know it's an angel because the other gospels tell us that there were angels present. And even in the Hebrew, this phrase, a young man, was very often used uh, by uh, Jews to describe an angelic figure. They describe him uh, as wearing a white robe. That's a sign of, of God's blessedness. If you go back and read in uh, John's revelation of Jesus Christ, how he gets this glimpse into heaven, he sees surrounding the throne of God uh, all these folks who are clothed in white robes. They're the, the elders and the martyrs. They're the faithful who are dressed in glory and blessedness. And so even though Mark doesn't tell us that this is an angel uh, we can very easily read between the lines that this is a messenger of God. This is someone who has been sent to tell these women something. And so they were amazed. They were astounded. They were confounded. They were amazed. When we come before God rightly, truly, when we experience his holiness, we should be amazed. If we aren't amazed at seeing who God is, at his presence, at his incarnation in Christ, then we're missing the point. Or we fail to understand God's holiness. When we approach God, it's not as someone who is uh, our buddy buddy, who, who we can just jump up to and say, hey, yeah, God, how's it going? You chilling all right up there? We need to be amazed when we experience God. We should be amazed every time we experience God. And not just the big experiences of God, when we see God moving in the life of, of someone who, who needed healing. Praise be to God when we see someone who has cancer and they're healed of it. Praise be to God when we see someone who is, who is nearing death, but they are brought back almost to life. Praise be to God. For those great experiences when, when there is need in our lives and suddenly that need is, need is miraculously met, praise be to God. We're often amazed at those things. But how often are we amazed at the little things? Amazed at the way that God works in our lives, giving us our daily bread. When was the last time you woke up and were amazed? that you are entering a new day to worship and serve the Lord. It's God who will call you home when he will call you home. The fact that you are alive, that you woke up that day, is by the grace of God. We should be amazed every time we open up our eyes at, that this is a day that the Lord has made. And what are we supposed to do with days that the Lord has made? Go out and waste it? Go spend hours on social media. Go immediately click on the news and sit in front of it and just soak in all that garbage. No. The psalmist says, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We rejoice and are glad at the grace that God bestows upon us. We should be amazed every time we experience God, even in the quote-unquote little things. These women were amazed at the man sitting there 
And in verse 6, he says to them, do not be amazed. Don't be concerned. You're astounded. You're confounded. Perhaps you're even confused. Remember, put yourself in their shoes. You don't need to be so taken aback by what has happened. Because you're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene. And he was crucified. But he has risen. He is no longer here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. Jesus was resurrected. Jesus was from the dead given life, his body. This is a triune work. Again, we're talking about the sovereign act of God in our daily lives and even within the resurrection. We have to remember that this is an act of God, that the language there, he has been raised. He was raised. The, the Greek, the, the grammar there tells us it's a, a passive voice. What that means is that Jesus is the object of resurrection. Jesus doesn't resurrect himself. God resurrects him. And of course, it is the triune God who resurrects him. In Galatians chapter 1, Paul describes that it was God the Father who resurrected Jesus. In John chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus himself says that he, the Son, with the Father, will resurrect him, Jesus the Nazarene. And Paul touches on this in Romans chapter 8, verse 11, where he says it is by the Holy Spirit that Christ was raised from the dead. God, Jesus the Nazarene was raised from the dead. The man was raised by God. Just like Lazarus couldn't resurrect himself, he needed Jesus to say, Lazarus, come forth. Jesus the Nazarene was resurrected by the triune God. A sovereign act. He is not here. He even points to the place where they laid him. He's not there. And so he tells the women, go, tell his disciples and Peter. He is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. That's an important key phrase there. Just as he told you. In fact, everything that has happened this morning was predicted by Jesus. On three days, he would raise from the dead and that he would meet them in Galilee. They knew. They should have known. They knew what Jesus had predicted. Interestingly enough, when we go through and read in the rest of the Gospels and all the Gospels that Jesus says, I will meet you in Galilee, what is it that the disciples do? They stay in Jerusalem. They don't even follow Jesus' commands or the angel's command. The angels told them to go to Galilee, wait for Jesus there. In, in the many resurrection appearances, they all happen in Jerusalem because the disciples didn't believe. And we're going to touch on that next week. The disciples never listened or trusted in this gospel message, this good news. And so, verse 8, they went out, the women went out, fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had gripped them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. They leave the tomb, frightened, and they run and they say nothing because they're scared. It is the doctrine of the resurrection on which the whole foundation of our faith and the gospel rests. If the resurrection didn't happen, then it's going to be hard to be a Christian. If you ever have an encounter with someone who is hostile to the faith, 
an atheist or someone of another religion, very often they'll start by attacking the resurrection. Did the resurrection really happen? Could it have happened? If it didn't happen, then our faith has nothing to hold on to. Because without the resurrection, there is no salvation. Without the resurrection, there is no grace. And so we need the resurrection. And so the apostle Peter, the same apostle who ran in fear and did not listen to the women and many others, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, he tells us that we need to prepare ourselves to defend the hope that we have. As we look to the end of the Gospel of Mark, we recognize that the resurrection just seems to abruptly <coughs> happen. The resurrection occurred, and then they run away. They run away in fear, and they tremble. Can we believe, can we trust that the resurrection really happened? Well, I'll give you three points on why we can. First of all, all gospel accounts, uh, well, they differ on what it says. That's the first thing, that all four gospels differ in how the resurrection or what the resurrection looked like. Now, that might seem confusing. At first, you might think, well, Pastor Ed, if they're different, why would anyone believe that? Uh, shouldn't they be the same? Why, why are they different? Well, they're different because they're witnesses. If you go to a, a courtroom, you go to a, a see any, any uh, a scene where a judge calls forth witnesses, do judges call forth only one witness and then call it done? They listen to the testimony of one person and say, okay, I'm going to make my decision on what this one person said. Probably not. You, you'd, if you came across a judge who did that, you'd probably challenge him or her. And so this, a, a good judge, a wise judge, will get the testimony of two or three or many people. If a, a situation or something happens, if there's a, a bank robbery and, and there's a hostage situation, that bank robbery, and you're, you, know, you, you have different people, five different people who witnessed that event, they're going to describe it a little bit differently. Oh, the guy with the gun was taller. Oh, no, no, he was shorter. Oh, oh you know, he was wearing a black mask. No, it was a gray mask. We're going to have differences on when they came in. The bank robbers come in at 902 or 905. And so the good prosecutor will figure it out. We'll get the good many voices and witnesses. And so what we see that the gospels are different actually tells us that the resurrection is true. Because if it was copy and pasted, if it was the exact same details on all four Gospels, then that would tell me it was a fake. That would tell me that it was fiction, that these 12 disciples made up a story and agreed to tell the same story. The very fact that they are different tells us that these were very real people who very really witnessed something. And their perspective in that witness was a little bit different. Just like the perspective of any witness in court is going to be a little bit different. The second reason why I know the resurrection really happened is that the disciples died defending it. If I told you a lie or you told me a lie, let's do it that way. If you told me a lie and you knew it was a lie and I said to you, listen, I'm going to punish you until you tell me whether that's true or false. You'd probably very quickly come around and tell the truth. If, if someone were torturing you on the threat of death, and if you had a lie, you'd probably say, hey, that was a lie, that was false. Please don't hurt me. I just agreed with my 12 buddies that, you know, we're going to tell this story. It was all made up. Please don't hurt us. 
Now, if you know something is true, if you know and you witnessed it as true, wouldn't you defend that even to the point of death? Especially if it is the truth. If you knew something was true, if you knew that someone had stolen that item and you knew who that person was and you went before that judge and lied to that judge's faith, face, oh no, I don't know who that man was or it was someone else who stole that thing. Why would you do that? Well, hopefully you wouldn't. You would tell the truth. You would tell the truth on threat of being thrown into prison or held in contempt of court. The very fact that all 12 of the living disciples went to their graves for the gospel tells me that the resurrection is real. They would not have succumbed to death, torture, imprisonment, banishment, boiling. That was what happened to John. He was boiled in oil, pierced by arrows, flayed, beheaded. Do you think they would do that for a lie? And the third reason why I know the resurrection really happened is because of what we see here in our passage and in the other Gospels as well, that the women were the first to witness it. Back in the first century, a, women's, a woman's testimony was not as convincing, did not carry as much weight as that of a man. And so if the resurrection was a lie, if the resurrection didn't happen, then you better believe that the first people who would have seen it would have been the men. It would have been Peter and James and John. They would have been the first ones to see it because then, in the first century, you could believe the testimony of a man. But instead, all four Gospels tell us that the first eyes to see the empty tomb was that of women. And in the first century, that was a very bold thing for them to preach. Because if they kept that detail in, that means the gospel writers were sharing a witness, a testimony. They, weren't, they didn't need the lie because it really was the women who saw the empty tomb. If it was a farce, the men would have seen it first. Now, that's what convinces me of the resurrection. Hopefully, it convinces you. And so I ask you, church, as we look to the resurrection, will you trust in the words of God that Christ was raised? Do you trust that it was Jesus who was resurrected from the, game, the grave? And then will you proclaim it or will you remain silent? Because that's also an important detail. Will you proclaim the truth of the gospel now that you know it's true? Or will you keep the truth secret? Will you hide it? Will you be ashamed to tell anyone of it? Because our actions reveal what we really believe. And as we'll come to see, at first the disciples really didn't believe that Jesus was resurrected. That Jesus had to appear to them multiple times to show them that he was real. Because here's the beautiful thing about God's grace. God's sovereign grace. No matter how hard we might fight to believe the truth, the Holy Spirit will make it known to us. Let us close with prayer. 
Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for resurrecting Jesus from the grave. We're so grateful that this triune work brought new life into the church. And Lord, I pray that as we bear witness to the truth of the gospel, that as we celebrate this season of Advent and this time of Christmas, that we remember the reason why Jesus was born, so that he can be resurrected from the grave, that our sins crucified with him will be washed and covered in his blood, and that we too can share in the newness of life, Lord, I pray that you help us to trust in the truth of the gospel. If there is any here who does not trust it, who has any ounce of doubt, Lord, I pray that you convict them, that your Holy Spirit enter into their heart so that they can come to understand the truth of the gospel. But not just to understand it, but to live it. Each and every one of us, as we Believe and trust in this good news. May we go forth this day and every day proclaiming that good news without shame, without fear, without concern. Because if the disciples are willing to go to their deaths for this gospel, we should at least be able to go to a, a point of embarrassment or beyond for the gospel. Lord, I pray for your Holy Spirit. It is in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen.